Thank you. So again, thank you for the, to the organizers for the invitation to uh, come speak here today. It's been really thought-provoking meeting thus far, and the, uh, the, the session last night also threw me into an existential crisis about what I'm supposed to be doing with my life in science and <laughs> questions I should be answering. So we'll see if I address any of those today. Eric so, well, you lost <laughs> well, exactly. I, was, I have new things now that keep me up at night. So we're going to uh, talk today about some of our work. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a problem that I think many of us are confronted with, which is the specificity of homologs and related proteins. How does this? Do? I thought this just worked. Tested it. One sec. Let me unplug and plug it back in. It's not working now. Oh, did it go? Okay. All right. So evolution has provided us with these large families of homologs. <clears throat> and particularly in eukaryotic genomes, we're, we're left with this issue of, of how do we understand specificity in the light of large families of very often similar transcription factors. Um, so this is the view. Um, and if you ever needed a picture to put in your mind to, that represented the problem with uh, homologs, I think it's this one that they chose to include on the front of this book. I have no idea what the conversation was like when they decided on that picture for that book. <laughs> so this issue of, um, of homologs and, 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 and similar binding specificity really raises two, uh, I think, kind of interrelated issues. And I'm going to talk about both of those today. We've had projects in both. And the first is, um, if things are evolving by duplication and neo-functionalization or, or changes, uh, how does that lead to the evolution of new binding specificities in transcription factors? Okay, we know that gene regulatory networks are a primary mechanism by which evolution and ad adaptation occurs. And so we've thought a lot about the cis side of it, but uh, the trans side of evolution hasn't been studied as much. And so that's one thing we can look at by comparing homologs. The other is just, so this is sort of depicted here by this diagram. You imagine in, we have a transcription factor and it has some target genes, and in time, you know, maybe it evolves to have very new target genes. And you can imagine with duplication and real neo-functionalization, this would occur, and this would allow us to get new regulatory networks. Alternatively, perhaps it happens like this, where because of the constraints in structural biology, maybe you have an overlapping set of target genes. You get some new ones, you have to lose some. And so the question of how transcription factors evolve uh, is still a really open question. And I think you can... The same diagram sort of uh, illustrates the, the, the problem we have with homologs in a cell. So transcription factors that are similar expressed in the same time in a cell, we have this problem. Our, and, and often, I think many of us are confronted with this problem, is that we, you know, in terms of chip or gene expression, we see that they have overlapping but not the same uh, set of target genes. And so how much of it's real? Where is the specificity coming from? And the second part of my talk will address this. We have a set of factors, and we really want to know where are they getting their uniqueness from. Okay, so these are the two questions we're going to talk about. And so in terms of the, the data, I think uh, what I'm going to talk about today um, and some of the ideas, I think, uh, are really being pushed by lots of these eight high-throughput techniques. So there's many, many uh, technologies. This is from a recent review we had uh, uh, methodologies or modalities that allow many, many protein DNA binding measurements. And the question is, what do we do with that information? And some of us, you know, Harman's talked about that, Luke has talked about it, I think uh, others will talk about that today. Um, and I think these large data sets Should I, I'm just going to Oh, well, that's really delayed, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe I gotta shake it. I'm just, you know, I'm just gonna use the, the, the I'll use the, the button. Uh, I don't know. I'm gonna work then. Oh, okay. All right. Let me just talk about this. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. So, so I think that the issues that come from these, I, I want to talk about the insights you can get from these rich data sets. They're very rich, and I think sometimes the simple models we derive actually mask some complexity that I think is really interesting. <laughs> Um, all right. Um, so, and that's going to relate to these issues with simple models. And then, and then the, the last part of the talk, I want to talk about how we should design these experiments so that I can really learn the best, uh, the models from, from the data. So I'm going to talk about two stories today, two short stories that hopefully will keep your attention for 10 minutes and 10 minutes. So the first is evolution of zinc fingers. So this idea of how, how we can use these rich data sets to understand evolution. 
of transcription factors. And this is a paper that came out a couple years ago. This is a work with me and uh, started in Martha Bullock's lab where I was a postdoc and, and finished in my lab now at BU. And the last one is on regulation of pathogen sensing. And this is very unpublished data because we just got the data last week, so you're going to see the very rough and ready look at the data and some of the problems we're confronted with. Okay, so evolution. Thank you. This may work? Okay. I'll try it when I go. So the zinc fingers, this is a, a huge family. Uh, massive expansions of zinc fingers have occurred throughout um, uh, many, many organisms. And one of the reasons we know about them is they have an interesting mod uh, modular binding um, uh, um, fold. So what I mean by that is individual fingers tend to recognize sets of, uh, so here's the amino acids, sets of sort of roughly triplets, okay? And this has allowed us to use them uh, um, to set up companies, to design zinc fingers, and obviously this is being, CRISPR is pushing this into a new direction now, so maybe uh, we won't use this as much, but it's still a, a, a big business. But it's also allowed evolution to use the same principles, which is duplication and, and modularization and, and change of, of these um, modular reader heads to get new specificities, okay? And what was interesting about this family for me is that we kind of understood the principles. So I kind of knew which amino acids were supposed to recognize which bases, okay? So I thought, okay, good, this is a good one to look at. Let me see if I can understand how they're evolving. So we started in yeast. Yeast has this really cool family of many, many factors for which there's only two. So it's a simple zinc finger model. Okay, so you have two reader heads. And because of genome duplications, we have these families. And so um, I organize, these are all the, the, the members, uh, I organize them by their canonical recognition residues. So the residues that I know mediate specificity, I said, well, let's put them into groups that should, by all, by what we understand, bind the same DNA. Okay? Um, and then the ones here, so there's two proteins here, and I put the line here to, to demarcate those that resulted from a, a relatively, not that recent, genome, whole genome duplication in yeast, and so they're very similar uh, paralogs. So then the question I have, and I sort of zoomed in on one of these families, there's five proteins here that should bind the same DNA. I said, do these bind the same, D, uh, do they bind different DNA sites, the same DNA sites, uh, and how do they deviate from the canonical model? So we had these really rich data sets. Uh, some of this was from Martha's lab and some was from Tim Hughes' lab in a big yeast compendium paper. And they, they measured the binding specificity using a universal PBM. So this is uh, a protein binding microarray. They have all possible atmers encoded in overlapping fashion and they can do very comprehensive measurements to small uh, k-mers. And this was good because these factors actually bind small k-mers. So this is a really nice data set for these factors. Now, when you take this really rich data set, instead of looking at logos, I said, well, let me look at the whole rich data set. So if I compare the binding of two proteins, I can look at it visually like this. So every one of these dots is an atmer. And an atmer is assigned a fluorescence value, and so we can plot those, okay? And so this is the whole landscape. So up here, yes? So, so each probe is not an atmer, right? So, no. so, so how do you know which atmer does it bind, or do you just assign it to yeah. Yeah, you, you look at all amers, you look at the median fluorescence intensity associated with each atmer. They, each atmer comes in many, many different sequence contexts, and so it's a median intensity for all the probes on which that atmer occurred. Yeah. So this is a technology that's been around 10 years, and they've been, yeah. So can you about something? Sure, sure, sure. So these instances are all within the same yeast genome, different genome. Oh, okay. Let me go back. Yeah. This slide before. Even her. Yeah. What is this? So these are all yeast from Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and, uh, and these are indi five individual genes, and I've organized them together because they all have the same canonical amino acid recognition positions. The DNA on the array is completely synthetic. Yeah, we're good. Is there another question? Yeah. Yeah, so is there a good reason why you, why you don't just plot the probe? intensities against each other while you go to these medians of eight? Sure, sure, sure. Because the, the probe intensity, the probes are 32 base pairs long with a primer, and they're a composite, composite probe of many overlapping atmers. So I could do that, absolutely. But then what I'm looking at, I would have to deconvolve anyways and say, right? So I mean, it would tell you directly how different the measurement says the binding of these two guys are to the probes. Right? It would certainly say, I could definitely look at the distribution of the probes, and then I, when, say I did that, and then I said, oh, look, there's something over here that's bound strongly by this factor, but poorly by this factor. 
then I would have these probes 32 base pairs long and I wouldn't know what in it was important. So I'd have to do some deconvolution anyway. So I, I could do both. Is that clear? Because it's many, many potential binding sites. No, no, that's totally clear. It's just that yeah, I yeah. don't know how much of this sort of mismatch yeah, yeah. Ah. from these Aitmer games that you're playing rather than... Yeah, uh, I can show you because we actually measure KDs for individual Aimers and it agrees well with the fluorescence. Yeah, we do EMSIS to, to validate the, the binding energies, yeah. And then actually in the last part of the talk, I'll show you uh, for these new factors, we do exactly what you want. We made binding sites in constant flank regions, measure the intensities to those where we've changed the binding sites and, and did the distribution. So we play the game with whatever data sets we have. This was available for us. Okay, so um, basically what I'm going to talk about uh, today is there's richness in this data that I think is not captured by the simple PWM model. Okay, So I have these five factors. I know this is a little grainy. This is from uh, the Hughes Lab paper. This is just the, the logos that I originally saw. When I came to this, I knew something about zinc figs, and I thought, those seem kind of similar, but are those differences that I see in the logo actually real? In other words, is there more there than meets the eye? So we took the eight MERS, we simply correlated them and said, do they group into specificity clusters? And sure enough, we had we did some measurements our, on our own. So COM2 is actually this one. MSN2, MSN4, these close pair logs are here. And this is it. And then these members had multiple measurements from papers from Martha, from Tim, and, and ourselves. And it was clear they had three different specificity groups that didn't quite, to me, track with the, the motifs. OK, so maybe the motifs weren't learned right. But we looked a little more. <clears throat> and so if we scatter these eight mers like I just showed you, um, you can start saying, well, let's look at these sp specific pro uh, spots that are specific to one of the factors and not the other. So we came up with an algorithm to determine a p-value for difference. And so I'm just going to tell you that for, for the purposes of this talk, these yellow ones are COM2 specific. In other words, they're much more preferred by this factor than this factor. These purple ones are preferred by this factor. And then we have some common sites. And so I said, well, let's look at the, the binding sites and say, what's different between these? And, and we see this actually for throughout the family. So here's comparisons with uh, COM2, and here's with USV1. Okay. And when you look at them, you see that there's clear differences. In other words, the common probes look like the consensus we expected. The MSN2 preferred ones here in purple have a really distinct uh, GC selection here. And then these uh, yellow ones have a different biology. You have know, corresponding yeah. uh, plots for repeats? For repeats? Um, you repeat MSN2 twice. What will be the plot? Yeah, it's, it's almost a perfect diagonal. We have that. I don't have it here, but I have it on my computer. We could, I can show it to you later. Yeah. yeah, they're very tight. In fact, what I have is MSN2, MSN4, which is the close parallel. That looks like a tight diagonal. Yeah. Yeah. Generate these uh, bottom logos. I mean, you probably had some items which were not exactly aligned. Yeah, this was actually just um, um, uh, from the aimers. We just sort of aligned them and look at the frequencies. Um, it's very rough and ready to get a sense for the specificity difference. Yeah. And so, to, to get to your point, one of the things I wanted to know is whether these differences were real. And so we measured the, of this AITMER, we measured the binding KD by, uh, by EMSA and saw that this difference in, in, in fluorescence between these is about tenfold KD and this is about a tenfold KD. So we knew these differences we were seeing were at least real in an equilibrium binding sense, okay? Is that clear? Okay, so these are real. We can pick them out and the question is how do they get here? So this is what confused me in terms of the evolution. These things, for all intents and purposes, should be binding the same DNA sequence. That's the model we know for zinc fingers, but they don't. So why not? So the first thing I said was, well, let me look at the sequence alignment across different yeast species. And I'm glossing over some data here. We actually cloned these from many, many different yeast species, and we did the experiments, and they were all the same. So they hadn't diverged for about 200 million years. So within these groups, the specificity was conserved. And so we found that in one of them, there was this conserved piece of uh, a protein outside of the canonical zinc fingers. And so it hadn't been discussed much that protein outside the zinc fingers would mediate specificity. <coughs> and to me, this is the take home slide for the richness of the data. And this, uh, I don't have an, an algorithm that demonstrated uh, why I, what, what am I trying to say? What am I trying to say? This was just an aha picture to me that demonstrated something interesting about the data. So we took these zinc figures, we mutated this little peptide. So it's basic here, 
we mutate it to some acidic amino acids. And what you saw is those specific amino acids for COM2 vanished. And now we have a much more correlated specificity here. Importantly, the affinity to these consensus spots didn't really change. In other words, there was a modularity zinc finger binding where you could mutate selectivity to just some sites. So there's a part of the protein that said, oh, you can, you can expand your specificity to now recognize new sites. So we can imagine, in terms of evolution going this way, we, we gain some basic tail that now allows us to, to select a new set of sites, but we can still recognize the old sites. Right, so we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We can just gain new specificities. What happens if you do the mutation the other way around? Um, what do you mean by the other way around? If we change Oh, that's a good point. So if we took MSN2 and added that basic tail, it doesn't work. I don't gain that specificity. So it must mean that there's additional amino acids that allow it to be permissive for that. And I tried, and I couldn't figure out what they were. So there's still hidden mysteries even within this, yes. I can break it, I can't make it. And the other one I'll show you, uh, I'm going to gloss some details, but we made it for another one, and it was complicated and messy, but we were able to do it. Okay, so, and again, this is just the equilibrium binding. I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. So here's our model, um, that you had a zinc finger binding mode which could recognize the common sites for this family, and at least one of the members gained a new peptide along with some other magic amino acids that I, I don't yet understand that allowed it to, to bind new sites. And, and in terms of Remo's interest, where everything in, can be thought of in terms of a minor groove interaction, we actually think that that's what's going on. This RGR peptide is one that Remo had identified as being often used by uh, protein uh, factors to recognize AT-rich minor grooves, and that's exactly what we see. When you have that basic region, you select for, you increase your affinity for AT flanking sequences. So there's this other family member. I'm going, to, I'm going to just gloss over the details and tell you here's our other model. So this is all published now. So in fact, what it was was two completely different mechanisms were at play. One of them had nothing to do with the tails. Uh, we lopped the tails off, and it was almost a complete line. And, and again, I can show you um, as if, how, how, how uh, tight those fits are. Um, and the other one was a bunch of amino acids that allowed the fingers, we think, to change orientation. Okay. Now, in terms of binding specificity and why I raised this for this meeting, is uh, th this really demonstrated that uh, two things were going on. One, in terms of evolution, you could get modular gain of specificity. Okay? You could change amino acids, by new sites. In terms of the, uh, the richness of the data, we would miss this. And if, we, if I hadn't sort of looked at the data set and said, well, what are these off-diagonal points, main mutations, looked at the movement of the, 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 the rich data set, I think I would have missed this. And so, to me, this is just a demonstration why we've been spending a lot of time looking at these kind of scatter plots and rich data sets to understand specificity. Okay. Ten minutes? Okay. So here's very new data. So uh, this is a project now that's under, uh, that we're doing in the lab. And this, uh, the project is to understand the regulation of pathogen sensing. So uh, an important part of the inflammatory process is the recognition of pathogens and turning on inflammatory genes. And so we have whole sets of these sensor molecules. The toll-like receptors get a lot of attention as early pathogen sensing molecules. And there are other classes, too, that sense things in the cytosol. And what, as we went forward, we've been studying this uh, certain uh, regulators of this process. Um, and we came across this group of proteins, the, uh, the interferon regulatory factors, that are very homologous. And they regulate sort of disjoint sets of these. In other words, they're differentially regulated by these toll-like receptor, um, uh, by these pathogen-sensing se uh, receptors. And so the question is, how does their regulation and their target genes affect the subsequent inflammatory response, and how does it tailor it? Um, and so what was puzzling is that these things have been proposed to bind the same sequence. Okay, so they're dimers; they bind to consensus uh, interferon-sensitive response element. So the question is, wherein does their specificity occur if they bind the same sequences? We knew that they do different things in vivo. Um, one of the most notable things is that certain members are upregulated strongly in certain autoimmune diseases, so they clearly must regulate slightly different uh, sets of target genes. Um, one question is why IR5 is so commonly associated with it as opposed to some of the other ones. They bind the same sequence. And this is kind of a busy slide, but I'm just going to go over it very quickly. Um, 
what we know is that if you overexpress these dimers in activated forms, they regulate different sets of interferon alphas. Okay, so we know that even under conditions that are comparable, overexpression in the same cell type, they can turn on different genes. So the details are unimportant, just the fact that there is specificity differences. Okay, so this is from the grant we proposed. So there's, you know, multiple possibilities for where they get their specificity differences. The simplest one is perhaps they actually don't bind the same sequence. Perhaps they have different binding specificities. And the others is perhaps they interact with cofactors. And so we're studying all three of these now. So I'm just going to talk about early data addressing this. So we had logos available. And this is from these beautiful compendiums um, uh, from the uh, uh, Joel et al. paper. And, and Esco, I think, will talk about some of the motif finding for some of these things later. Um, and so we have these wonderful data sets, but one of the things that I, when I first looked at the data, I thought, again, just like I had with the previous papers, how much do I believe the little differences? And, and this is, you know, there's a different motivation. When you really want to understand one problem well, you really want the details. You really want to understand. I want to understand if every single one, I want that, the model that Leonid wants. I want that God-given delta G model because I want to make very precise predictions um, and so when I looked at these, I thought, well, this is interesting, but there's some issues that I wonder about. Here's the sort of c consensus model, the IRC with two direct repeat kind of elements. Um, and then, you know, for the ERF3 model, I see that there's a little bit upstream. Is that really specific to ERF3? Or is that something in the motif finding? I, I don't know. Um, ERF5 had this dimeric model as well as a monomer model. Is that specific to ERF5? Can ERF5 bind as a monomer and the others don't? From the motifs, I don't know that. And so, and again, ERF7. And then there's even the differences within these things, these small differences. There's a C here, but nothing here. Are these real? Do I believe these differences? I mean, that's where I was at. And so we said, well, you know, I don't want to do 1,000. I want to do three. So I'm going to do three in, in excruciating detail and ask whether I can get a better model or a more detailed model, and how will that help my predictions? So... So it turns out the earth dimers actually require phosphorylation to form the dimeric forms. Uh, and the experiments hadn't been done previously. And I'm sort of, it's interesting that the, the Joma motifs are as good as they are, quite frankly, because I think they overexpressed them as in, in hex cells. So, and they weren't activated. So I, I don't, I'm surprised they got the, as the, the motifs as close as they did. So that may be an issue with overexpression in cells and doing the cell X. Anyhow, so we decided to bite the bullet. We made these phosphomimetics. So we made... We, my student, made a lot of mutations. Uh, and so these form dimers. They've been shown in cells to become to be constitutively active. So we did our binding assays uh, with these activated dimeric forms and hoped that we could, you know, really look at the right species. So the question is: Here's the conceptual question I want to ask: What what probes? If I can if I can design probes to look at this, what should I put in there? So we've seen people talk today about the, the genome context PBMs that were looking. Uh, 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 Remo have looked at where you can look at the flanks and the, the important aspects of DNA bendability. Should I just take, if I really want to understand SNPs, should I just be taking sites and making SNP mutations and measuring the affinity? In other words, what's the best approach? Just take many, much, a lot of data and learn a model or to actually take very specific sequences and mutate them and ask what the changes are? So we did both. We decided to do both in the context of this simple set of families. So We've included several thousand of these genome context PBMs derived from ChIP-seq data. So the ChIP-seq data is of questionable quality, but we, we took many of these sites. Um, we also have what I'm going to call these SNP-type probes. So we took many, many sites, um, I think about 50 sites, and we exhaustively mutated every base position and just said, all right, you know, if I really want to understand SNPs, I want to make a good model, let me just do that and see how well it agrees with models I learn another way. So we have many of these, and we can imagine that eventually we're going to transform this fluorescence into some sort of an energy type model. And the question I want to know is how, how much data we need to do this, how reliable it is, um, and how well does it fit models learned another way. Because we care so much about this family, too, we said, well, you know, the, like I showed you before, the motif suggested there were differences in different parts of the binding site. And so one can either just learn models and say, okay, look, there are differences there, or you can go test it directly. And so we decided to test it directly. So sequence, this is the canonical sequence, and then there is some suggestion that there were some important amino uh, base positions five prime to that. So we said, well, let's just test them. Let's take a, we t so we take a, a, 10 of these different sequences and we exhaustively sampled those bases and said, let, let me just see what the distribution is and how much 
those bases affect the binding. We also look for the monomer binding, right? The logos previously had suggested there was monomers, so I said, okay, well, let's mutate a whole bunch of sites and take one site away and ask what happens. So this is what, because of the customized platform we can get from Agilent, we can play these questions. And the question I'm really interested to know now is whether this provides us new insight, whether we can make slightly better models by just doing this excruciating detail, or whether this is just useless and I'm wasting my time. So I'll know either way in about a month after we finally chewed through all the data, but I think it'll be worth it. So here's a, a in the last couple minutes, I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of what the data looks like. Again, we just got it last week. Clearly, when we scatter these, so this is the PBM data. And here, we haven't used ATMERS. We've actually, these are just like the SNP sites, so it's the same sequence flank context, it's, you know, very directly comparable <laughs> measures. And we see these. Um, so this is one experiment uh, replicated over uh, 10 replicates. Um, but we'll be doing multiple experiments and replicating over those as well. And I'm not going to have time to talk about it. We're also going to do this at multiple concentrations to get a better feel for, because obviously these are single concentration measurements. We're going to do it at a couple different concentrations of the protein to see whether we can interrogate you know, different affinity ranges. Doing And, and we've published previously on, on, on the utility of this. Importantly, we see there's clearly IRF-specific binding uh, demarcated by these strong off-diagonal components. So there's clearly sites that are specific to ERF-7 here. So ERF-7 binds these, ERF-5 doesn't, and vice versa. And the question we really want to know now is with really good models, can we understand that interferon data I told you about before? If, if I could just make models for those interferons, I feel like I would have made progress. So we're going to take predictions from this data set, make reporter genes that have those things, change the, change the site from one of these to one of these, and ask, do I see the, 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 the change in, in a gene expression like I expect from the simple model? Uh, I'm going to go through a little quicker. I just want to highlight a couple things. So, so here's an example of SNP type probe. So here's one seed sequence, and here's all the different mut mutations to that. And again, here's high affinity, and here's going into low affinity. This experiment, I think we need to do a higher concentration. But here's, um, OK, I've, I thought it was a different. Uh, we do the same thing with this one, and again, we see that there's some clear differences. The IRF5 likes these GATA-type alternate sites. where, If you just look at the, where the red is on this axis, it's, it's bound well by IRF5, but really poorly by IRF7. So for us, that's a nice prediction. Okay, let's go look at the, the, the interferons that IRF5 regulates and ask, is this a simple enough model? And can we change something to become IRF5-sensitive from IRF7-sensitive? We also believe, because this is such a minor change, that we can find the amino acid. We're, we're making mutations to see if we can switch ERF7 into an ERF5. And then we'll ask whether that simple amino acid change can, can explain differential interferon expression. So we're uh, looking to do those in the coming months. So here's the heart of the, the issue I have with the models. So here's just three. Uh, and I don't mean to be unfair comparing to the, the JOMA data, because I think they're wonderful data sets, and they, they put us in a place to start this process. But here's the level of disagreement that I need to understand. If we want to make really detailed models, I need to understand this. So for example, for these three sites, Earth 7s on this axis. It, our data says this site's really strong, and these two are lower, probably OK, but about the same. This is in disagreement with the, the PWM, which says, uh, this, it's insensitive to the C here. But we see that there's a change. OK, so you can say, well, that's just a minor thing. There's going to be differences between models, and PWMs learn from high throughput data. You know, and I understand that. But the question is, for us, for this problem, we really want very detailed models just for these factors. And so I feel like I need to push it a little farther. And so this is why we're going through all the song and dance of making very detailed measurements and asking, can we improve the models? And the same thing is demonstrated here. These are the same two sites. Now we're looking on this axis. We see that the specificity is very different. We, we see it's flipped. So the PWM predicts that the C would be favored here. But when we measure it, we see that the G is favored. The, you know, this one's a little farther on this axis. Okay? So there's small differences. Maybe they don't matter. As we do reporter assays, we're going to see whether this matters for gene expression. Because I don't have a feel for this yet, and I think many of us don't. And we, this came up in the discussion last night. How much is an affinity in terms of what, what's relevant in terms of gene expression? And so for these factors where we have really biologically relevant questions to ask in terms of cytokine expression, we're going to try to push this and understand where do small differences make a difference and how much do they make a difference.
Okay, I'm just going to go ahead. Um, so again, I talked about testing things like monomers and stuff. Uh, we also looked at the flanks, and so this is just early uh, looks at. We clearly see that uh, these positions have an effect. Okay, so let me just wrap up right here. So I think that, again, these rich data sets sometimes are not, I think by just, if you care, I think looking deeply at the data and asking, uh, does the simple model really explain everything I'm looking at, particularly for, for close uh, paralogs? We can, you know, if things are the same, they should look like a line, and they do when you do replicates or close homologs. And when they don't, there are differences. And the question is, I think these differences are important, and we should drill down. I think the zinc finger uh, story was an example of that, that there, there's a lot hiding underneath simple motifs. But second story, again, uh, we certainly see that these factors exhibit clear differences, as suggested by some of the motifs, but I think even beyond that. Um, and that we're really trying to understand whether customized uh, PBMs for factors we care about can provide more insight and better models that will allow us to get more precise um, predictions for the gene regulatory impact and the role of SNPs on these things. Okay, in summary, so this work was done by, all the IRF work was done by Callan, a graduate student in my lab, and Brian was a technician who helped finish up the zinc finger story, and that was done in, uh, uh, with Martha Bullock while I was still a postdoc. Okay, thank you very much. So, the implicit assumption, at least the way I see it in your talk, which is very reasonable, is that uh, if you have uh, a lot of homologs, they must have been specified, or some of them have been specified to, or somehow it's evolutionary, it became more specific to some sites, right? But there is the... Yeah. So there is the other direction that people have talked about that there is an advantage to having redundancy encoded mm -hmm. as well. So even yeah. though you have homologues, they might be doing very similar things. And one way people have looked at that is to look at the resulting gene expression of knockouts, for mm -hmm. example. So did you compare, so you have these very nice comparisons of, uh, you said MSN2, MSN4 are almost identical, but MSN2 and the other one are not. Yeah. Did you compare? knockout results for them in a similar way and look if there is any correlation between the similarities on the PBM? And the yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So we, we definitely did do some of that, and it was very hard to make models. Uh, so there was knockout expression data under certain stress conditions that we could look at, yeah. um, and there was clearly differences in their gene expression patterns. Uh, there was data from Aaron Segal's lab, and they'd look at USV1 under certain high salt conditions. And we never came up with a really compelling model that said, yes, the differences we see are ex explaining the, the, the gene expression differences. Uh, and then this is one of these issues where I was leaving the lab and was already started my own lab. So, so I don't have a good answer to that. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that uh, I think that this is just a, a one tiny snapshot in the evolution of a single family. And I think... Uh, we've seen some of these things, many of these factors. And in fact, Ruluk and I were talking about this morning. We, there's many times we do these experiments where like, they look like replicates where there's no differences, even though we know there's different functionality. So I think the point is there's going to be a continuum of differences. We'll see all sorts of mechanisms. Um, and, and I think it's a fruitful place to look. Um, but I think the follow-up studies, like you mentioned, will be really important to ask, what are the implications in vivo of those? And, and so this sort of start, stops a little short for telling that full story, I agree. Hi. Um, so I don't know much about um, learning these kind of uh, uh, position weight metrics and models, but I was wondering whether um, now that you know that it seems to be um, that you need to identify things that distinguish, that sort of discriminate yeah. between different factors, that it might make sense to use different types of probabilistic models when you have data like your, uh, this data you were talking about where you think involved and you take the median. And I was thinking yeah. that if you have that type of data, for instance, mm -hmm. you know that you're looking for uh, differences rather than consensus, you probably want to learn a model of each probe sequence because it'd be very important to learn when a probe sequence differs from another probe sequence. Yeah. So you might want one of these richer deconvolution algorithms because it might give you much more than the median approach. And Sure, sure, sure. No, that's an excellent point. In fact, so I'm glossing over some details in the interest of time. So the, the first story was what we call the universal array. And 
Harman and many others here have, have looked at this in detail and how best to learn models to predict that data. So there's many of those experiments done. There's some nice review articles, in fact, on multiple models, multiple camera models, different ways of learning linear models for that data. And so I'm just sort of, I wasn't actually even using a model here. I was just looking, looking at the data. Um, and I think that there's people who are better able to speak uh, about that and about how to learn those models than I do. But I agree fully that um, um, although some of the reviews seem to s show that basically linear models do pretty well, right, Harmon? Am I? I'm looking for confirmation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Anyhow. Yeah, yes, and no, I guess PPM, there's this effect of where the binding site yes. is. Yes, yes. You have to deal yeah. with Otherwise, you know, it's. Uh, you're unbiased. But yeah, you could fit, say, a weight matrix like model to the two experiments and then maybe compare the delta delta G coefficients, right? Uh, yeah. See to what extent you can explain the differences in your scatter plus in terms of individual probes and, you know, cameras yeah. in terms of those uh, DNA features. It could be shape features as well that you get. Yeah, so there could be these other aspects. But, but I agree there's different approaches. The, the second one I showed was actually much more, it was a, much more limited only because this is the way I think of these things. And in other words, I didn't want to have to make a model and decomposite stuff. I said, I just want to make the measurements on those things change single bases and say, what is the impact? And so for those, I'm really looking at making the most minimal model I can. And so what we're struggling with right now is we've been implementing some of the stuff that Remo and Reluca have talked about, support vector regression, to look at both the, base, the bases as well as shape. But then also just making the measurements just from just from the single mutants or mutagen, uh, mutagenized DNA, um, and saying what's the impact, and just saying can I model it in a very dumb way based on biophysics? So in that case, I'm actually moving away from trying to learn from these deconvoluted nested cameras to just more direct measurements. So I don't know what to do. Yeah, well, let's, uh, thank you.